maybe turn up the volume, Eli. All right. Okay, so that's that's Lama Jimpa's beautiful metaphor for faith. And um, in the retreat, we talked about the four stages of faith. So first stage of the faith is clear or admiring faith. The second stage is longing or strong interest. The third is confident faith or conviction. And the fourth is irreversible or unshakable confidence. So I'm going to share with you my journey in working through the first three stages. I wouldn't say I'm in the fourth yet. But I've, I've recently um, moved into the third stage, which is incredible given my history, right? So, and as you enter into the, uh, the rabbit hole of my mind on this talk, you'll see why. <laughs> okay, so stage one is admiring faith. So my experience was coming here, liking what I saw, liking how I felt, liking the people. I'm like, wow, there's something here that we want, I want to get to know. And Sharon Salzberg in her article says, bright faith with its exhilarating sense of discovery makes a wonderful beginning to a spiritual journey, but it can make for a faltering middle if it's all you have to count on and for a bad end if we are unwilling to go deeper. So for me, I went into it eyes wide open. I was doing research. Uh, my friend was telling me about the scandal it was happening in the Shambhala community at the time. So I was very much like reading that, trying to figure that out. Uh, the second time I came here, a disgruntled patient burst into the, the Gompa while Lama Jimpa was speaking and called him a false Lama. I mean, so there were some things going on at the same time that I was taking all of it in eyes wide open as I came here. So now I'd like to share with you a quote by the Dalai Lama. In order to develop a faith derived through reason or through understanding, a beginning spiritual aspirant should be open-minded. For want of a better word, we can call it a state of healthy skepticism. When you are in that state of openness, you are able to reason, and through reasoning, you can develop a certain understanding. When that understanding is strengthened, it gives rise to a conviction, belief, or trust of that object then that faith, trust, or confidence will be very firm because it is rooted in reason and understanding. Because of this, we find in Buddha's own scriptures an admonishment to his followers that they should not accept his words simply out of reverence to him. He suggests that his followers put all of his words to the test. Just as a goldsmith tests the quality of gold through rigorous procedures, and it is only as a result of one's own understanding that one should accept the validity of the teachings. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I put it all to the test using my background as a journalism or as a journalist. So I've worked as a journalist for 20 plus years. And as part of being a journalist, a, a big part of the job is research. So you could say I've been a paid researcher for a while. <laughs> So how do we research things? Well, first of all, you wanna approach your subject, whether it's a topic or a person, in this case, it's both the topic of Buddhism and the teacher uh, with, with an open mind and as much as you can, uh, neutrality. So um, we, we have different ways of treating people in leadership versus ordinary people, right? So for ordinary people, you have to have something that's really verifiable if you're going to publish it in a, news, in a newspaper, right? Because you could slander that person. So you have to have a very high bar for putting something negative out there about that person. But for anyone in leadership, they are not, um, they don't follow the same rules, right? Leadership is so important that we have a lower bar for sharing um, bad news about that person basically because they affect so many people's lives. So in this context, especially in Buddhism with the um, how important the guru is, how important the student teacher relationship is, that's a super high bar that, that we're trying to make sure is correct about this person. So I have scrutinized <laughs> our teacher very respectfully for a very long time. And he encouraged it. You know, that first year, he's like, have at it, you know, please do your research, you know, 
um, and I did. So what are some things in journalism that we use that I applied for our very own teacher is, of course, you um, look at what else has been written on the topic. So you're going to do your online research and you're going to find out who else has written about this person. Um, what did they say? We also um, access public records. Um, I didn't actually access public records on Lama Jimpa because I didn't feel the need to, but just for this talk, I went ahead and checked the Sacramento Superior Court, and uh, that's an act of faith, right? It's a week before the talk, <laughs> and I'll be happy to tell you that there were no results returned for uh, Stephen Bryant Walker, but there's a couple other Stephen Walkers out there that you should watch out for. So um, <laughs> there you go, just saying. Um, you want to interview the person, of course, what do they say? And then you want to observe the person. What do they do? You want to talk to other people about that person. What are they saying about that person? And then you want to check their credentials. So what does the lineage say about that person? And the more and more I observed and learned, like, what I'm looking for is the overall picture and I'm looking for patterns. Um, so if you have a bunch of things saying one thing, but then you've got one outlier thing, then you're going to probably think that that outlying fact is maybe not true. Or in this example, if you're a great leader, um, there should be some people that don't like you. Because otherwise, what do you stand for? So if you really stand for something, there's going to be people out there that may have some negative things to say because they don't agree. So I found that everything that I scrutinized on Lama Jimpa really did add up to um, what he was saying, what he was doing, what he stands for, the people's lives that he's affected. And that's given me great confidence in being here and, and following him. And then, of course, your personal experience. What is your personal experience with that person? So um, the next thing as a journalist and as a student or as anyone is to be aware of what your biases are, because your biases will absolutely affect the conclusions that you draw, especially if you're not aware of what those are. And in journalism, if you are unable to write a story fairly, you are required to go to your boss and take yourself off the story. Say, hey, I have a bias against XYZ, please give it to someone else because I'm not able to do my job. So I'll just give you a little example, a simple example. I had a slight bias against the color of red for a long time. Um, to me, it was associated in my mind with aggression, anger, blood, violence. If you're going to buy me flowers, buy me pink flowers. The red ones are not going to work out right. But if you walk into this room, we've got a lot of red here. <laughs> So that's a bias, right? But fortunately, I think a few years back, I'd done some color study and learned about, um, especially in Asian cultures, all the positive meanings for red that they have, that brides wear red. In China, it's a symbol of happiness and prosperity. And if you're a child growing up there and all your celebrations are just filled with red, when you see the color red, it's going to give you that warm and fuzzy feeling. So I was able to change my perception of red before I came here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, if you have trauma associated with your biases, so for example, something really awful happened to you in a red room, and red triggers your trauma, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you to approach that um, with neutrality. And you may even have to do some therapy before you could even sit in this room, right? <laughs> doesn't mean that this place is bad. It just means your biases are coming into play. So it's very important to look through your biases. Biases can be anything. It can be a color. It could also be cultural, all these other stuff. You can go to uh, the Harvard biases study and actually take a test and find out where your biases are and how they might influence you. So that's a really good source for looking at your own biases. OK, so let's get back to faith. That's the journalism background. Um, so I moved into stage two, which is the longing stage. I would say for me, stage two started when I took refuge, where I said, OK, I'm here. I'm taking refuge. I'm going to do this. 
but the questions and the observations continued. So I learned about a little thing called uh, skillful doubt in my research. I really liked that. I was like, I have skillful, skillful doubt. That's what I've been doing this whole time. <laughs> So skillful doubt, it leads to exploring and getting closer to the truth, and it strengthens our faith. So that as opposed to something called cynical doubt, where we say, I don't like it, that's it, I'm going away. So it's got this like walk away, push away feeling, so that doubt doesn't lead you anywhere. Um, so Sharon, in, in her article, I really liked her article, said after his enlightenment the buddha arose from his place under the bodhi tree and set out walking along the road the first person he encountered was struck by the radiance of his face and the power of his presence dazzled the man asked who are you the buddha replied i am an awakened one the man just said well maybe and walked away had he shown curiosity then taken the time to follow up his doubt by asking questions he might have discovered something profoundly transforming. So, doubt. The other thing is, um, you know, during this second stage of faith for me was testing, right? It was taking the Dharma principles, putting them into work into my life, and then see what happens. Does it work? And the results in my life have been profound. Um, my uh, mental state has improved drastically. I no longer have to take medications for depression, anxiety, and all those other things. I've experienced complete healing for my past traumas. I have improved relationships. I've, um, you know, even like just people that I really care about that I'm having difficulties with, those things have like melted away and gotten easier. Um, typically before I was really um, very depressed and just profound depression actually and now i experience a lot of joy and a lot of peace like actually that's like baseline for me now that's huge that's huge i have more clarity i have more stamina i have less burnout at work so these principles have really worked for me in my life and so recently i would say it's just been you know in the last month or so i've feel that I've moved into the confident faith stage, the third, where I just really feel it's a conviction for me. And Lama shared with me four ways to examine things. He says, you know, what do your past teachers or the scriptures say? What does your current teacher say? What does your logic say? And what does your true experience say? So for me, it's, it's definitely been a coming together where I feel like everything's making sense. Everything fits together and um, I feel it. Like not only is it making sense to me logically, but I feel it like in my heart and my soul. I literally feel it in my body, like this um, sensation right here that's like a buzzing sensation that just kind of warmth that spreads through the body. And so all of this like reinforces one another. And Lama says, when you have those four things, the four legs of a table are even, so the table stays flat and stable. And for me, I also look at it like some days, maybe you're not feeling it, like maybe you're feeling a little down and you're not feeling connected to your faith. You've got these other things that bolster it up because you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna go to the cushion because I know that it's right and then other days maybe you're confused about a point logically but you've got the feeling to pull you through so that's that's how my faith has become very deep and dynamic and and you know very strong there's also another um metaphor that we use in our researching in journalism that i've heard is that uh, when you're researching a topic it's like rolling a snowball so as you first start rolling it, every time you push it, the snowball gets bigger and you can see it growing and you can see it changing shape. But after a while, it's gotten so big, every time you push it, you don't really see much difference. Like you've got like a pretty good overall view of what it is that you're looking at. 
Um, so at that point for me with faith, it became a decision. It was like, well, this is what I know. This is what I feel. And now like, what am I gonna do about it? So now I've, I've increased my, my commitment, basically. Increased the amount of time that I'm spending on the cushion. I uh, even rearranged a flight so that I could be here <laughs> longer when we had the chaplaincy training, like things like that, making it a bigger priority than before because I'm like, okay, now if I don't, I feel like I'm just wasting time, you know? So I've got this sense of urgency now that, that just developed very recently. So it's been interesting. It's just hearing about the stages of faith and then really like actually seeing how they've kind of unfolded has been really beautiful for me, especially given my issue with the word faith to begin with. So, he says in the third stage of faith, uh, Lama Jimpa said that doubts can coexist here, but you actively work to resolve them. Also, I find that like, if I see some, Lama Jimpa doing something that's not making sense to me, because I have all this background research, I know it's probably because it's not making sense to me, not because it doesn't make sense. So usually I'm going to try to find out why right? So you are actively working to resolve what those things are. So now I just want to talk a little bit about the word confidence. And this is the active portion of the class. <laughs> Who here believes that they can become enlightened in this lifetime? All right. It's kind of hard to put a lot of work into something if you don't actually believe that it can happen, right? So for me, logically, I have to say, like, yes, I can, because we all have Buddha nature. Logically, it is possible for every one of us, especially when we have the guidance that we have. Emotionally, I'm still sitting there going, hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> that sounds really hard. But logically, I'm like, okay, well, I've got to, like, I've got to put the effort in because logically it is possible. Hopefully the emotions is going to catch up here, but it got me to thinking about what am I confident about and why am I confident about it? So I'm going to go back to journalism. Um, I was a photojournalist for more than 20 years and a conservative estimate for the number of photography assignments I have done is 2000. So I've done 2000 plus photography assignments. And I am confident that, okay, and these assignments are jumping out of airplanes. They're uh, fires, floods, fashion, court, uh, car accidents, uh, you name it, that's been in the newspaper, I've been there. So I have the confidence that I can go into any situation with my tools and I can create a professionally publishable picture. Now, is that picture always going to be amazing? No. Is it always going to be inspired? No, but it's going to have a basic level of professional quality every time because of the experience. So then I look at the Dharma and I think, well, we have unlimited numbers of times that we can practice the Dharma in our life every day. And if you practice it every day, day after day after day, where am I going to be in 20 years with it? You know, I'm going to be pretty confident at that point. You know, Lama Jimpa says he's been doing this for 50 years, you know? So, I mean, I don't know. My reasoning says <laughs> that if we apply ourselves, that we can build that confidence and gain some ability to do this thing. So... So that, that leads me to stage four, which is unshakable faith. So, I mean, it feels pretty unshakable at the moment, but who knows? Like, um, Lama Jimpa said that uh, unshakable faith is really recognized in uh, retrospect. After some time has passed and we look back and we see what we've brought through with it, we say, hey, you know, it's unshakable. Like, I've gotten through all that and I know I can get through whatever's ahead of me. So um, 
that's my talk for today. I would love to hear um, your input and your questions. And we have people at different stages here. I would say if you're at the beginning, like put it to the test, do it. Like it, it's only gonna make you stronger, you know? So, all right, that's it. Who wants to say something? <laughs> Okay. I'm like looking at myself instead of all the people on Zoom. I don't really need to look at myself, but. Mic test, mic test. Any questions? Thank you, Autumn, for such a, a beautiful talk. Um, I think I needed this today. I, I missed uh, most of my meditations this week. I normally come a few times, and I was noticing the difference of, like, not sit sitting. And I do prefer it in group, so <laughs> I'm working on doing it on my own more often. But, yeah, this today has, yeah, it just makes sense. It just makes sense, everything you said. Um, what's really struck me, honestly, too, is um, you, you were talking about biases, biases, words, um, and how our traumas influence those. And I literally had a talk with my partner this morning about, like, just, you know, the things that I'm noticing and, like, the way that it's deeply impacting me. And it just all makes so much sense. And so just thank you for t like putting that into words into a way that like I can, I can grasp. Thank oh, you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Um, trauma biases, like I will say that I went to, I think 12 years of therapy before I came here. So that helped like dealing with some of that before I even came here. So it may be, you know, if there's still trauma that so you want to do both, right? Because you, you got to address that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not easy, but it's possible. Very possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Autumn. Um, <clears throat> with regard to unshakable faith being something that we see in, in hindsight, uh, do you have any um, thoughts about what it looks like prior to reaching that stage when things are shaking? Right. So in order to have it be unshakable faith, you have to be able to look back and see when the rug gets pulled out, somehow it still works, right? So there's still application. But when the rug pull happens, everything changes, right? And if you're not yet in step number four, or if you're not yet in the unshakable faith territory, what advice, recommendations do you have for dealing with those moments or those periods where everything is changing and the situation is now different. And, you know, it's easy when everything is sort of like, everything is sort of rhythmic and sort of stays the same, right? Like you develop a certain routine, but then when everything shifts and everything changes, you know, what to do during those periods to sort of con continue our practice and, con and be able to then get to that fourth stage where we look back and we say, wow, even when everything went to hell, everything changed and it wasn't, you know, I didn't understand what was happening. Even then I was able to persevere and now I have this great confidence. Yeah, I'll actually give a two part answer to that one for those, those knee jerk stuff that happens and then one for like the deeper things so who was here last week when my son stored the stage okay so my three-year-old ran up on stage uh when llama was coming up here i was completely mortified and my gut reaction was to take my kids and run away right because that's, <laughs> that's all i knew i was like i am completely ashamed and mortified and so i took my son and I went into the, the um, 
the next room and I was watching and everything was telling me like, run, like go, just run. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm giving a talk on faith and I just want to run away right now. <laughs> but I couldn't because my shoes were here. <laughs> I literally couldn't because my shoes are here. So, um, and you think about it, that's actually an act of faith. You're actually making yourself more vulnerable when you take your shoes off when you come into this room because you literally can't run away easily. <laughs> so so there's that when you put things in place or now now I'm going to take it a, a level deeper. And, you know, I've been with my partner for 17 years now. So those times when things get tough, like it's going to happen gonna happen you know but what are the things that you put in place before it happens that keeps you there you know I bought a house with my husband i have kids with my husband like you can't just run away you know so if you've committed yourself like that keeps you from taking that knee-jerk response and then you say okay well i'm here i've committed myself now what do i do so when things get tough you're gonna apply yourself and go through just go through it you know with your partner you know you figure out what's going on you make the effort you know to fix things or you know with relationships they keep growing like the two people keep changing all the time so you have to continually keep coming back together and i think it's the same with faith where you're going to have to continue to apply it and you're going to keep changing and then you're going to have to apply it different ways so I'd say it's part commitment and, you know, part just like willingness to do it and try it. And since you've got all this other stuff backing it up for so many years, you're not just going to cut and run. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I can't. I don't have much. Um, thanks for your talk. Wonderful talk. Um, I just want to share just a quick little thing. What Dylan, I'm sorry, uh, Dan said. Um, something that really taught me that really works for me is the a metaphor of the labyrinth. And he has one in his office. And if you've ever walked a labyrinth, you, you see, like, fairly quickly, you think you're going to be at the center. And then it kicks you back out. And wait a minute, I was so much closer, and now I'm farther out. What's What's going on here? And uh, that keeps happening as as you walk the labyrinth. And at some point, I think ideally you, you just are on that path, and you're meandering, enjoying the the ride, so to speak. And all of a sudden, you're there. So I like I like to think of uh, the path that way. It's not it's certainly not linear. Oh yeah, not linear. <clears throat> um, so. I was thinking about um, trauma as well as you, when you brought that term up, and I, I uh, take an expansive view of trauma that is more of a spectrum, um, and it's certainly not my own view. It's Gabor Bate, if you guys know him, he's amazing. Look up his work. But um, his view would, would put all of us in this room having some degree of trauma. And I think that we, most of us maybe come to Buddhism looking for cessation of suffering and um, trauma is like suffering and steroids on some level and, and uh, i've been on both sides of the, the the couch so to speak so i i know the therapy but um i was curious if it's not too personal how beyond therapy how has the dharma helped you to overcome your trauma oh that's a that's a big one Oh man, it's been such a journey. Um, and it is hard to uh, answer that just because it is very personal. Um, no, no, it just, I, it, it's funny because like, the, the the main switch that flipped for me was actually something that I knew um, logically, but wasn't actually like taking into my 
life. And I had so much like, like violence within myself against myself. I was really like attacking myself. But when I met Lama Jimpa, like it became clear all of a sudden that that wasn't okay anymore. Like, <laughs> like I couldn't have compassion for everyone else and not myself. Like I'm included in the everyone, right? And so when I dropped that and I said, no, this is this, you know, like he really just like kind of mirrored this back to me, like, and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is not okay for me to be attacking myself like this. You know, it's like everyone else is cool except for me. You know, it's just, just ridiculous. So I just, I, I, I dropped it, you know, it was weird. I, I dropped it. And then like relationships with my family improved because I wasn't so defensive all the time. I just it really felt like I was dropping the weapons. You know, I'm just like, that's it. Like, I'm not going to be violent anymore. <laughs> not that I was like physically violent, but I just it was just this feeling of like done, done with that, you know, and then it was like, ooh, like this lift up feeling of like, ah. Oh, I'm not so burdened anymore because I'm not getting in my own way. I'm not like lashing out at other people with my traumas. I'm just like dropping it. But I do think having that 12 years of trying to work through this stuff in therapy helped because I was ready to be done. <laughs> I just needed someone to say like, hey, um, see that hammer you're using upside down? Just flip it over try it like that <laughs> like whack oh wow that worked you know i was ready to do it you know but when when even when you're shown the way a lot of times people don't take it because then that means that you have to admit that you've been doing it wrong for so long and that's really hard for people to do just to admit that i've spent all these years spinning my wheels but for me i was just so done that it was very easy for me to take that next step. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. That was very, very informative and helpful. Thank, Thank you for your welcome. talk. I just wanted to make a comment about um, the idea of un the unshakable and how we have to build up um, and experiences that will show us that we, you know, we've done this. I think another big part of that, when the ground starts to shake, um, is to look at others. And I think if you have a sangha where you can observe how others have been through these things and are still trying, are still working, or come to you with um, some very positive help, is a really big way to look at, oh, this can work right now for me. I'm, I'm questioning. I'm not sure what's going on. But I see these other people that have been here and are doing this and watch our Lama and our other teachers and our Sangha and go, oh, yeah, well, they're still trying. they are still got that attitude that I'm hoping for. So I think that's something we need to remember to look at around us. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a really important point. That's the refuge in the three jewels so when you're having trouble yeah sangha being part of it absolutely yeah. wow that's my answer <laughs> thank you for allowing that because i'm very um timid to speak in a mic in front of people so get it over with <laughs> Autumn, thank you so much for your wonderful talk um, and sharing your story with us. You know, um, I'm so happy that you've overcome what you've overcome. It really makes me feel really good. <laughs> so I wanted to say that, but um, also I wanted to talk about. Um, um, sorry, I have a brain injury, so I. I forget the end of the sentence. Give me a second. Um, you were just talking about it. Um, oh. oh, yes. OK, I remember now. <laughs> um, so a few years ago, I, I, when I was here, um, I, I've had a lot of 
trauma in my life, physical and emotional. And like you, I was very depressed. I had a lot of depression growing up. <clears throat> um, and I had a lot of therapy and a lot of um, medication. And I kept um, facing more and more trauma. And a few years ago, I, I kind of hit this um, part in my life where all these terrible things were happening and um, I didn't know how to deal with it. And I reached out to one of the advanced students here and she told me that I should do some meta for myself. And for me, that was a very foreign concept. Like for me, no, I don't do that. I, you know, I have compassion for others. And I had kind of like you were saying, you know, this kind of not hatred for myself, but pretty darn close, you know? Um, so this idea of, of, of um, repeating good thoughts for myself over and over and over and over on my mala <laughs> was like, can I do this? So I did, and I did that for several days, and I, all of a sudden, it was like I woke up, and all of a sudden, I just felt light, and I had this incredible love for everybody, you know? I, I just felt this overwhelming feeling of, ah, huh, I just love everything and I love everybody. <laughs> so it was this wonderful thing. And what it was is I needed to like myself, you know, I needed to love myself before I could feel like everything was okay. And so that that was a huge turning point for me in terms of my steps on this path. So I just wanted to share that and thank you again. Yeah. Sounds like you've got some experience in common there. Thank, thank you. I also love your talk. Oh, thank you. And, and um, when you, I, I was, I have my bias when come to the word faith because there is many ways that people use the word, right? And there is a lot of faith that is like. Okay, you don't need to think, you don't need to ask, you don't need, you just trust that something higher will come and take care of everything. So we, it kind of put us in a situation like a small child who doesn't know anything and let your parents to, to decide for you. But it, what happened with the small child is that the child grows. And one day the child has to think by, him, by himself or by herself, like what is the best, right? So to, to give that to a higher power, you also make yourself a child forever and not, not capable of your own evolution, let's say. And then you, when you, you said about the bias, it's, um, and we all, we all come with our bias, right? We all have a history, we all have ideas about things. And one thing that comes to me is that we really be trained, most of us in, in the West, especially, we are trained to separate things in good and bad. This is good, this is bad. You are a good person, you are a bad person. Um, you're going to do the right thing or you're going to do the bad thing? You know, all the time we have been put in position, but we don't have a chance to decide what is good and bad. It's kind of imposed from outside, and you're just fitting in good or bad. And we are try all trying to fit in good, most of us, <laughs> at least, right? Most of the time we want to fit with the good um, archetype, I don't know. I was. I would say that that my my vision of 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 good and bad are kind of mixed. It's not because I don't know the difference. It's more like like thinking that if if trust can open a lot of doors for me, also I bring my 
being suspicious, questioning, looking for evidence and trying, trying to see what it is by what it is, not coming with a preconception that I have to trust because, you know, so I have to trust the teacher because he's a teacher. Well, I need to trust in order to be open to receive something, but then when I receive that something, I have to find out if that something is helping me or not, mm -hmm. and if I will keep trusting or not. So I keep the negative thing as a positive thing. So it's good, it's good to questioning, it's good to ask, it's good not to trust 100%. It's good to have both, you know, and not trying to fit in, in, in one side of reality, but see the whole reality as it is. So you may, you may get disappoint, disappointed more often if you do that, but that, that's uh, trying to be real trying trying to be to be enlightened so that that's for the question like about becoming a buddha the the other view is that we are struggling to get to to a point to a place but the place is already here right we're just we are just uh um we are in the way between so let's say in the first person i am in the way between me and the Buddha is just me in the way. So uh, uh, if if I'm not in the way, I am the Buddha, and I don't need to become. So it's kind of it sounds kind of tricky with the words, it is tricky. but I think the the idea that um, you already are instead of you want to become. If you want to become, it will be I. My vision today is that if you ask me, can you become a Buddha, I will say it's impossible. That's, that's Roberto speaking. But you may ask to me, and if the Buddha speaks, I'm already, I'm already here. What are you trying to become? Where do you, where do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I, I do think words are super important, too. Like, you know, just to reframe that. Maybe you're not suspicious. Maybe you're 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 using skillful doubt. You know what I mean. And and I some of that reprogramming that it was such a relief to me that like no, you don't have to come in here trusting anything. <laughs> you can come in here and you can be open. Like as a journalist, we don't go in trusting people, right? But we are open to what they have to say. You know. So I think you can be open even if you're not trusting and then through seeing things play out you can then decide that you're going to trust it you know what i mean but having trust as a prerequisite for admission is pretty difficult i think so i just wanted to there we go. I have to get really close with this one. This one does not obey the four the four four inch rule. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to say uh, graciously thank you. Uh, a real heartfelt thanks for your research and the time and intention it took you to put everything together and to speak to us. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to express to you how utterly grateful I am for your talk because uh, I'm a kindred spirit. Uh, the only difference is I was raised Southern Baptist and I used to ditch school with uh, Stephen Mark, who were Mormon. It was a church next door to us. We would meet at the fence and take off uh, because, yeah, blind faith was expected of us and it was not somehow it just didn't fit with me even as a very small child so i just have to say thank you to you thank you to lion's roar thank you to la Majinpa, even though he's not here and thank you to the sangha to actually put forth your talk and to really show us that there is a skill in doubt and that it's welcome and that blind faith you know, uh, even Roberto talking about it, you know, it does put you into a place of being a child and that, you know, that's, that's not all, we need to be having our eyes wide open all the time. So uh, 
thank you for your dedicated research and time. Uh, I did it as well. I don't have a journalist background, so I was probably slower at it than you. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. And in the interest of andragogy, right, adult learning, what I truly want to say after thanking you is to say, can you repeat the four steps for us again, just so it gets locked into yeah, sure. our mind? Thank you. Yeah, it's, um... Okay, first step one, clear or admiring faith. So we're at the bottom of the mountain looking up. Longing or strong interest. So we're starting to climb. <laughs> Confident faith or conviction. And then irreversible, unshakable confidence. Wow, people have a lot to say about faith. That's awesome. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for your talk tonight, or today, sorry. Um, time zone in my head is off, I guess. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was actually, um, I tried to come here when we moved up here, well, not too late after we moved up in 2016, like maybe a couple of years, or maybe closer to three years ago, I came to this um, center, and um, I was just beginning my... Um, like a doctorate of audiology and, and I did a year of that and that didn't work out but I, I see now like that maybe I, I was of the thought that maybe I shouldn't juggle too many things while doing that to try to get that to work and then I see that after I did that like I feel like I, maybe I needed to fix this first before doing that so um what you spoke of tonight was very, very, um, or today, was very, very, um, she keeps coming out, very, very um, awakening, very refreshing. Um, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to begin the path this time, this time around, so thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And, and the path is very different for everybody. I mean, I started at six minutes of meditation and that went on for a couple of years. Like, it's like everybody's got to start, start where you are and do it your own way. You know, like any effort is to be, you don't want to say like, oh, I only did this. You know, you want to say, hey, I did this. Like I did one minute of mindfulness today <laughs> like that's it or i even thought about maybe doing some mindfulness today <laughs> like you know it's very important that's what lama's taught too is to just be gentle on yourself you know yeah all right well appreciate everybody's uh talk today and engaging on this subject matter. So thank you very much. It's been a lovely day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, closing prayers. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful trends and tens and gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. Most all magical display of. I don't have this memorized, guys. I'm sorry. The teachings flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Most all magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of the stream and profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalish Vashara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjri Shri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Sangdrapa, a maybe crest at your holy feet. Thank you.
we already did that one. Yeah. I just have an announcement. Um, so this week, uh, starting on last Friday, uh, there's been daily prayers for the Dalai Lama's long life. Um, we sponsored some of those through Harun Kanzan. Geshe Dongshala is there in Dhamsala. Um, and Jodhan Pasha will be there in India on the 25th. Um, the date in India is the 25th. Um, in the morning to do those prayers um, live, and then they'll be online. So that would be the 24th at 8.30 p.m. Um, if you want to watch those. Uh, but as a part of the, the sponsoring group, we gave uh, $2,500 to Haran Kanzan to sponsor these prayers and sponsor the, the lodging, the tea, the food, the travel um, for these prayers to be done. So if you want to help with that, that would be great. I think we do have a link online at this point, or if you want to just do a general donation and put in that it's specifically for um, Dalai Lama prayers, um, that would be wonderful. We'd really appreciate your help um, in making that happen. Um, but, you know, it's just a wonderful opportunity for us to, you know, see Geshe Damsho probably will be there, who knows, probably on television. Um, He's been in several other things recently. Um, he's because he's studying at Guto. He has that access to be able to go to the teachings that uh, His Holiness has given. So, but it's even more important because uh, Dalai Lama had the flu recently and actually canceled a whole bunch of his travel schedule for November just to be able to recover. So, his prayers are really important, um, and hopefully, you guys will watch them and do them in in your mind while you're going about it, or just even add it into your regular practice for the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, I just want to uh, announce that we are doing a book giveaway, a Dharma book giveaway. And so we'd like everybody to um, bring any Dharma books that they'd like to give in your home and place them on the table in the library. And then all of you are welcome to take any books that you find on the table um, to home and read them and enjoy them. So please do that. That will be going on until the 7th of November. And then after the 7th, if your books are still here, we just ask that you take them back home again and we'll wait for next year. <laughs> Thank you. I, I see you, Andrew. I just, just wanted to say one thing. Okay, so um, just I just want to uh, let people know that next Saturday, uh, Geshe Tang is returning to teach more on the eight verses of mind training from two to five, and then Sunday, Lama Jumpa is going to be speaking, and that'll be his. Then he's going to go away for a week, so that's going to be very. And we're set, uh, um, celebrating a special Buddhist holiday that actually lands on Friday, and I don't know how to say the name. I need to ask Connor. This is Labab Duchin. So that's, um, Lama Jinpa's going to talk about that um, special holiday on Sunday. I just wanted to say that, so. So after uh, Dan's talk a number of weeks ago, uh, I, I had this idea of a uh, um, Dharma men's group. And so I've, I've been dragging my feet on that. But if anybody um, wants to, to talk afterward, um, that's interested, maybe we can get the ball rolling. Dharma men's group, Dharma dudes. Dharma dudes. <laughs>